Well, let me ask you this. What do you think so are some of the upper potentials of the mind? We've been talking about impairments and how to solve them, but do we have mental abilities that we're scarcely aware of? For example, uh, certain musical composers just hear a symphony in their head and they write it down. They don't even think that they composed it. It just came to them from somewhere. Uh, is this the sort of thing that anybody could do in theory? Or, or people who perform amazing feats of memory, like, like the chess master who plays 10 games of chess simultaneously while blindfolded. He's got 10 chess boards in his mind. When an opponent announces his next move, he visualizes the move, visualizes his counter move, then goes on to the next board, and when he returns to this board, it's still there. I'd like to say that none, no such thing comes from nowhere. It comes out of a person's individual experience, and in a sense, it's hard won by the engagement of their brain. So if you look at the chess master at their hippocampus, which is basically controlling the brain's re re controlling the relationship of things in space and time, chess, chess masters have an enlarged hippocampus. They have a bigger, this, these operations in their brain are more powerful than they are in your or my brain because they've exercised the, the, the blazes out of it. If you look in the area that we use, to, to recognize faces of individuals. They use that area in a, in a heavily uh, specialized way to recognize the patterns of a chessboard. And you can actually do experiments that show that they have powers. They basically have a chess master brain you do not have. Well, maybe you do have, Marty, but I don't have. Mm. And the point is, is that we have these capacities for very substantial exploitation through our, because our brain is plastic to drive these special abilities. And anybody that's a master at any, any, anything has, in fact, created that master's mastery by changing their brain in a progressive uh, way in their lifetime. Now, if you want to maximize the potential of your brain, is it a matter of treating the brain like a muscle that you always have to exercise and make stronger? Or is it like looking through a dirty window and you just have to wipe the window clean so you can see clearly through it? Well, I think it's like a muscle in terms of you have to condition it, you have to you know, take time to uh, sort of rear it and to sort of mold it. And so I think that's true. There's a lot of um, effort and time that needs to be put into any sort of intervention. But as I mentioned, sort of wiping the slate or wiping the windshield, there are many maladaptive things that we learn throughout our life. And for many of us, uh, you may need to take time to unlearn those kinds of behaviors, and that takes time. And so it's really a process where many times it doesn't happen overnight. And for some people, it may take many years for them to sort of get to a level that um, is functional or that they find desirable. What do we understand about consciousness itself, if anything? I realize this is a hard question. There are no good answers. But I'm just tossing it out there in the hope that maybe something will come out. What do we mean when we say that somebody is conscious? Well, of course, you can look in the brain when, when a subject is aware. And you can see that, that, that there are certain uh, operational characteristics in play when, when, that, that are associated with awareness. So we have a lot of correlative information. We know a lot of ways to alter consciousness. We know a lot of ways to destroy or kill it. And, and so we have, an, we have a level of argument about consciousness arising from the brain as a product of physical processes. All of the studies, though, uh, argue about its nature by these sort of parallel correlative arguments. You know, we really don't understand the nature of that, of that, uh, of that present awareness. We don't really know where the spirit comes from in a sense. But we certainly do, there is a lot of evidence that it's springing out of the brain as a product of, phys as a, of a physical process. Yeah, because there's also a school of thought that says that thought itself is a fundamental property of the universe, not just an electrochemical byproduct of something else. And on the other hand, when I'm in thought, I can see activities move across the brain. So I can do this in a very controlled way in a brain. And I actually can see the brain uh, move its way across the problem or solve a problem or make an association or draw a relationship. I can actually see those activities in the brain and understand on a sort of elementary level how the brain is achieving those things. So on the one hand, we can say, well, it's all mysterious and somehow it's above the physical operations of the brain. On the other hand, I can look at activities in brains and I can actually see, I can actually witness things happening that are clearly happening in parallel with those operations. And what about intelligence? You know, most people assume they know what intelligence is, but I gather it's not quite that simple. Is it a single trait or a combination? What does it mean when we say somebody is really intelligent? 
Well, I don't think you can get any one definition of intelligence because there are many different types of intelligence. Some people are good at music. Some people are good at art, science. And I think intelligence is really sort of, um, if you have to take a step back, intelligence is really sort of um, you know, adapting and choosing, selecting your environment. And I think the people who are good at that particular skill are intelligent. I think intelligence means different things in different situations with different people. And really, it attests to, for any one individual, how adaptive they are to different things that come up in their life. Is it largely about pattern recognition, the ability to tell how things are alike and how they're different and organize the world in terms of differences and similarities? There are also more elemental things that relate to it. How fast are the operations of the brain? How fast can it move across the possible solutions to a problem? The number of answers when there are many alternate answers. How, how, how well is the brain recording information? How reliable is its, how, are its operations? How stable are they? All of these things contribute to its operational effectiveness. If you want a, if you want a general definition of intelligence, it is operational effectiveness. And you could say you, you carry it to the level of, of complex problem solving. And of course, but to do that, for a brain to be facile as a complex problem solver, it has to have very good, very stable, very high fidelity elemental operations. So it's actually built on a large pile of critical fundamental skills and abilities. All of that grand complex art, uh, operational ability comes out of having a very facile treatment of all of the elements. It's like learning all of the elemental skills of mathematics before you can really operate on a high level. Your brain is constructed that way. It constructs all of the elements when they're in, in tip-top shape. Then you have real powers to, to grow from. And I'd love to get into that in more detail. Unfortunately, this half hour has gone by far too quickly. So I'm afraid we're going to have to come to an end. I'd like to thank my two guests, uh, Michael Merzenich of the University of California, San Francisco, and Simon Tan, clinical neuropsychologist at Stanford Medical Center. Thank you for watching. Visit our website, www.futuretalk.net. For Future Talk, I'm Marty Wasserman. See you next time. <laughs>